Another really common function that we deal with in algebra a lot is that of the quadratic function. So we define a quadratic function, or we say a second degree function, like this. It's f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And here, um, a, b, and c mean real number constants, of course. And a can't be zero, otherwise it's not really quadratic anymore, right? It's first degree to be linear in that case. If you try to graph a quadratic function, you're going to get a nice bendy shape like this. We call this a parabola. And so if you notice the parabola here, we've got a few key terms to point out. So um, where linear functions, you have slope. We don't really have to worry about the slope here, but we do worry about the intercepts. So these are my x-intercepts. And if you remember, that just means the points where the graph crosses the x-axis. So in other words, your y-coordinate is zero in this point. We also have the sharp end, or the bend. We call this our vertex. And it's pretty standard to write the vertex as a coordinate h comma k. So that means this vertex has x coordinate h and y coordinate k. All right, now also the vertical line passing through the vertex kind of divides the parabola in half. So it looks the same on both sides of this thing. And we call this our axis of symmetry. Now mine's not to scale, so it looks kind of wonky, but we'll do some in Desmos. You'll see that nice axis of symmetry there. All right, now what would be kind of neat is, you know, we have the standard form of the quadratic function, this ax squared plus bx plus c, and it looks like we, that looks something familiar to us when we think back to quadratic equations. But is there a way that we could take a quadratic function and instantly find the vertex? That would be very handy. And so there is a nice way to do that. We call this vertex form. So a quadratic function written in vertex form looks like this. f of x equals a times x minus h quantity squared plus k. And so hk, in that case, is your vertex. a is some sort of scalar. And the question is, what happens to the graph as a, h, and k change? So we're going to look in Desmos to see how that works. And then I'm going to show you some examples on how to get quadratic function into vertex form so that we can graph it. All right, let's take a look. Here I'm in Desmos.com, and we want to look at, again, how do the values of a, h, and k in vertex form affect the graph? Okay, so first of all, let's start off with our basic quadratic function, which we know is a parabola, y equals x squared. And this parabola hits right at 0, 0, has a vertex of 0, 0. Okay, now we're going to play with the values of a, h, and k. So why don't we start out with h? So if I take g of x, and let's say I do x minus 3 quantity squared, what do I have? So here I varied h. I'm not worried about k and a yet. And notice what happened. I have the same graph, the same shape, but where the vertex was at 0, 0, the vertex of the new graph is at the point 3, 0. Okay, so when I varied h by 3, I moved over to the right three spaces. Okay, so that's going to be true for whatever h is. So let's do another one. How about this time let's let h be negative 3. So that, what would that look like? Instead of a minus negative 3, I think I'd say plus 3 squared. Look at that. I have the same shape, but now this blue parabola has a vertex at negative 3, 0. So when h was negative 3, I moved to the left three spaces, or moved negative 3 units on the number line. Okay, so it seems like the h is a horizontal shift. Whatever h is shifts your graph that many units. All right, so let's look at a few more. Let's change k. So this time I'm going to take x squared, and this time let's say x squared plus 1. So now I have taken k and made k from 0 to 1. Now look what we have. I have the black parabola as my original parabola, and I have this red one. And look, its vertex is at 0, 1, where it was 0, 0. So it shift up one unit. Okay, um, just to confirm our suspicion, let's look at x squared minus 2, for example. This time I have the same shape with a vertex at 0, negative 2. So it took, the, it took my curve, my black curve, and moved it down two units. So where h is a horizontal shift, k is actually a vertical shift. So that means whatever k is, is going to move your graph up that many spaces. Okay, now let's look at a. Let's let a be 3. Okay, so now notice my red graph has the same vertex, 
but it kind of bends a lot faster than the black one. All right, what if I did something like how about 0.5 x squared? Now this purple parabola has the same vertex as the other two, but it kind of widened out. So it seems like the a value actually does something about how condensed or how stretched out our parabola is. Okay, so if I make a negative a, let's say um, negative two x squared, then it looks like I still have the same stretching that I would if I had positive two, but the negative value pushes the parabola upside down. And that's exactly right. So what we can say for a is if the absolute value of a is greater than three, or I'm sorry, greater than one, then it's going to condense your graph down. If it's less than one, it's going to stretch it out. If a is negative, it's going to be the same thing. It just flips everything upside down. Okay, so let's think about f of x equals two times x plus one quantity squared plus four. Do we know what this looks like? So first of all, let's get a base so we can compare. And here's f of x equals x squared. And now I want to say again, f of x equals two x plus one quantity squared plus four. Okay, since I have h here is negative one, I know that the vertex is going to shift to the left one unit. Since k is four, the vertex is going to go up four units. Okay, so that means I have a vertex at negative one, four. The two, since the absolute value of two is greater than one, it's going to contract my parabola a little bit. All right, so let's check this out. I think we're going to get this right. So here I'm going to say two times x plus one quantity squared, and we need our vertical shift of plus four. And look what we said. You can tell that the blue bends a little bit faster than the red, and also it has a vertex at negative one four, which is exactly what we confirmed. And this shows vertex form very well. Okay, I have a couple more of examples for you. Let's take a look. Okay, so now I wanna look at this example, and it asks us here to sketch the graph of the function g of x equals negative two x squared plus two x plus 12. It also specifies we need to find the vertex and the x-intercepts. All right, so that means we have to find two pieces of information and then graph it. Okay, so since this is written in standard form and not vertex form, it's not easier to find the vertex at this point, it's the easiest to find the x-intercepts. So I'm gonna start off with that. So one, x-intercepts. And remember the key to that always, no matter what the function is, is let y equal zero, or in this case, g of x. So that's gonna be zero equals negative two x squared plus two x plus 12. All right, now that is a quadratic equation. We've dealt with that a lot. And in fact, I can factor out a negative two out of everything. So I have x squared minus x minus six. And I can divide both sides of the equation by a negative two, because zero divided by negative two is still zero. It helps me just kind of simplify my work here. So I have x squared minus x minus six. And now remember, the trick to solving quadratic equations, the first thing we should try is factoring. So I'm trying to factor this into two things that multiply to give me negative six and add to give me negative one. All right, so I think about it for a little bit. Multiply to give me negative six, add to give me negative one. How about negative three and positive two? All right, those multiply to give you negative six, add to give you negative one. If you get it wrong the first time, that's okay. So what that means is I have x-intercepts at three and negative two. If this is my graph, then I know I have x-intercepts at three and negative two, those two places. Okay, now I need to find our vertex. And so to do that, you get it into vertex form. So I need, again, I need to get it to look like a times x minus h quantity squared plus k. So how do I do that if it's not written in standard form? Uh, we're gonna use the technique of completing the square. So if you need a refresher on completing the square, I have a video on that, please look it up and hopefully it can help you catch up. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna say g of x equals, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna separate everything that has an x from it from the constants. So in other words, I'm gonna have negative two x squared plus two x and let's leave this plus 12 out here, okay? The next thing I'm gonna do is the terms that have the x's in them, the x squared and the two x here, I want the leading coefficient of the x squared to be one, right? Because in vertex form, I have a one in front of the x. Okay, so here I'm gonna take out a negative two. And when I do that, I have x squared 
minus x, I still have the plus 12. We haven't done completing the square yet, but here's where the magic happens. Okay, remember completing the square, you take your middle term, which is negative 1 in this case, you divide by 2, so it gives me negative 1 half, you square that, so that would give me a positive 1 fourth, and then in quadratic equations you add it to both sides. Here we're not going to do that, but we are going to put it back in in this way. So I'm going to have my function again, I'm going to have negative 2 x squared minus x, and then here's where something special is going to happen. Like I said, in a quadratic equations we'd add it to both sides, but this time I'm going to say plus 1 fourth, which makes sense, but then minus 1 fourth immediately, and that may not make sense. Okay, because you may think, well, a fourth minus a fourth is just zero, right? That's true. Yeah, that's exactly why we could add it in. Because if that's a zero, then my equation from here to here has not changed. And actually now this is in a useful form because if I can just get this by itself, then that's going to factor very nicely. It's going to factor as a perfect square. All right, so how do I get this by itself? Well, in other words, how do I get this negative one fourth out? All right, so let's think about it. So here I have negative 2, x squared minus x, and I'm going to go ahead and write what we want. That's what we want. And I want to take out the negative 1 fourth, okay? So how do I take the negative 1 fourth out of these parentheses? Well, let's think about why those parentheses are there in the first place. They're there in the first place because everything inside those parentheses are being multiplied by, what, negative 2, right? That's how we got those in the beginning. So if I'm going to take the negative 1 fourth out and everything inside the parentheses is being multiplied by negative 2, I'm going to change this function unless when I pull out the negative 1 fourth, I multiply it by negative 2. So that's going to be a negative 2 times a negative 1 fourth, and then of course I have my plus 12. All right, now this looks confusing, but look, I have negative 2, x squared minus x plus 1 fourth factors very nicely. It's going to factor as x minus one-half quantity squared, okay? Now, you may have noticed that looks familiar. Yes, it's from this term here, and that's always going to work that way. Now, I've got to figure out the rest of it. So, let's see. Negative two times negative one-fourth becomes a positive one-half plus 12. Let's go and get that in the, into the common denominator here. That would be 24 halves. So, finally, I get negative two x minus 1 half squared plus 25 halves. Okay, now our arithmetic was a little bit more complicated than you'll normally see in these questions, but we have now got it in the appropriate form, and I can tell you what my vertex is. It's going to be 1 half, 25 halves, right? H, K, H, K. Sometimes students want to say negative 1 half for the x coordinate, but don't forget that it's x minus h, x minus h, so it's 1 half, 25 halves, okay, so let's see, 1 half in the x direction is about like right here, and I need to go up 25 halves, which is a little bit bigger than 12, so here's 12, let's go up a little higher than that, and this thing is going to bend down, okay, I have my x-intercepts here, I have a vertex up there, it's going to bend down, is that surprising? No, because remember, a, in this case, was negative 2, a negative a makes the thing turn upside down. I hope this makes sense and thanks for watching.